first time in 25 years of ministry, I leave the pulpit to address a sermon. And I'm reminded of a conversation that I've had many times over, in particular with grooms at a wedding, when they say, ask Mark, I'm nervous. And I said, well, let's look at that a little bit. What do you feel physically when you're nervous? Oh, my stomach's all butterflies. I keep talking. I'm thirsty. Okay, well, that's, that's a valid interpretation of how your body feels when you're nervous. Let me ask you another question. How do you feel when you're excited? Oh, Pastor Mark, I get butterflies in my stomach. I, my mouth dries up. I talk a Oh, Pastor Mark. <laughs> I'm excited, aren't I? <clears throat> well, there's, there's truth to, to both of those. And, and today I stand before you, sans pulpit, a little nervous and a little excited. But I stand before you today knowing that if the Holy Spirit will lead me to it, the Holy Spirit will lead me through it. Where was this Holy Spirit during the Old Testament? Today we read in 1 Samuel that Saul was anointed for a particular moment, for a particular occasion. And on that occasion, he was to prophesy, and it appears in Old Testament, that that spirit again leaves Saul. It's not a permanent thing. And when we look at how the spirit is interpreted in the Old Testament, we see that the spirit is an intermittent thing. It's, it's bestowed upon people at particular times for a particular purpose. Where was the Holy Spirit? Well, that's a great question. In fact, it's such a great question that Jesus decided it was a question he needed to respond to. And at the time of his death, as he prepared to leave us, he made the admonition that he would leave us an advocate in his stead. An advocate. A holy counselor we hear in other parts of the New Testament. This Holy Spirit is something that Jesus said, if you believe in me, each and every one of you is endowed with the Holy Spirit. I've been asked, Pastor Mark, what is the Holy Spirit? I think that the Holy Spirit is our moral conscience. In effect, Jesus indicates such. It's to, to help us to determine the difference between sin and knowledge. When the Holy Spirit is explained to children, I, I try to say to them, listen, when you watch TV, and on TV there's a picture of a child who's thin, who's starving, who's from some other country. When you see that picture on TV, how do you respond? What do you feel? And the child will say, I feel sad. I feel horrible. That's the Holy Spirit. Oh, I get it. For a child, it's simple. And as adults, I don't know what happens to us, particularly as adults, but it becomes harder for us to determine and to define when the Holy Spirit is working in and through us. I love what was said earlier, because it was a perfect definition of one of the ways that the Holy Spirit comes to us. I got goosebumps. I heard a song and I got goosebumps. I think that's the Holy Spirit trying to get out, right? And you trusted that Spirit. And for many of us, when we are indeed in the midst of a spiritual experience, we sometimes take the flight or fight route. We fight the Spirit, 
or we take hand of the Spirit and walk with it and allow it to walk through us. If the Holy Spirit will lead us to it, the Holy Spirit will lead us through it. I think as I look back on my life, the first time I ever could define, and this is well before ministry, could particularly define a moment when I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you may relate to this. It was the first time as a 20-something year old man that I held my daughter in my arms. It was at that moment that my heart was full and complete. And I loved it so much, God gave me another one. <laughs> Just to make sure that I really got it. And I'm like, gosh, did I get it. I don't know how the Holy Spirit works through you. It's different for everybody. But what I'd like to suggest today is that you trust it a little bit more. Trust that if it leads you to it, it will lead you through it. I had an experience, and I thought if I was going to stand in front of you and talk extemporaneously, I'd tell you something that I know. And something that I know is an occasion where the Holy Spirit was at work in so many different ways. And I don't know if we have any animal lovers here today. Does anybody have a dog or a cat? Had a dog or a cat? Or a... We have a small farm. I have horses, dogs, cats, chickens, ducks, geese, pigs, sheep, lamb. We have it all. I wanted to make sure that our children grew up on the farm, and boy, did they ever. I had a, uh, an occasion where I was going through a pet store, which is always a bad idea for an animal lover, going through a pet store. And I came across a puppy who reminded me of a dog that I grew up with when I was younger. It was a Brittany Spaniel. My grandfather had Brittany Spaniels forever. He used to hunt pheasant here on the Cape, back when there used to be a lot of pheasant and quail on Cape. So we had a Brittany Spaniel with him all the time, and that Brittany Spaniel was a hunting dog for him. So I saw this Brittany Spaniel in the pet store, and I knelt down, and as I knelt down, the first thing it did was try to kiss me through the cage. I thought, okay, buddy, you got my heart already, and now you're just making this worse. I invited my wife to the mall. After work, honey, come to the mall with me. I want to show you something. So we got there, and, and of course, the Brittany Spaniel was trying to kiss her through the cage. And my wife is looking at me saying, you're absolutely crazy. What are we going to do with a dog? So we live on a farm. We should have a dog. Brittany Spaniel's a great dog. Been with him all my life. I know him well. Casey was the Brittany's name. And I had Casey at this time about six years. And there was an occasion where I let Casey out and Casey didn't come back. And as any person who loves animals can imagine, it, it brought fear. Uh, we lived on a busy road. I was afraid that it was maybe hit by a car. Several days went by. Lots of prayer went by. And finally, I, I put an ad in the Bangor Daily News. I put an ad in Uncle Henry's. Brittany Spaniel, missing from Orrington, Maine. Please call, and I left my phone number. Days went by, nothing. And about seven days after Casey disappeared, I, I received a phone call. And I said, uh, yes, Casey's still missing. Well, she said, um, I know this is odd. You're in Orrington, Maine, but I think I saw a Brittany Spaniel off of the Etna Dixmont exit off of I-95. You might want to check it out. Thank you very much for your call. I really appreciate it. So as I talked with my wife, I said, there's no way. I said, that's, that's about 16, 15, 16 miles away from our house. There's no way that's, that's Casey. There's just no way. Never left the yard. Time went by. Still no responses. I put another ad in the Bangor Daily News, no calls. Three weeks after the fact, I get a call, and I recognize the voice. It's the same woman. Mr. Bruce, I still believe that there's a Britney Spaniel up at the Edna Dixmont exit, and you might want to check it out. Thank you. 
I appreciate your call. So finally, at this point, I said to my wife, I said, this is it. If this isn't her, then this is it. I, I just have to say goodbye. So I drove the, the 16 miles. Pam went to work. I hopped in the car early in the morning. And I drove the 16 miles down I-95, thinking there's no way on earth that she would get this far away from the house. But I'll go see if I can help another dog get reunited with their family. So as I got off the Edmund Dixmont exit, I looked everywhere. I couldn't see any sign of a dog, no sign of people. And there was a little grocery store over the overpass. And I went to the grocery store. And I asked the man behind the counter, has anybody around here seen a lost dog, a Britney Spaniel? Well, as a matter of fact, we have. There's a state trooper that lives down the street. And he's been coming in here every day, buys one can of dog food, brings it over and he feeds a dog over on the other side of the inner city. He said, I, it's been there for about three weeks. <laughs> get back in the car, drive over the overpass, get out, and I start walking down the, what is the exit ramp, the Edna Dixmont exit. And there's a large pine tree off the side of the road and as I'm standing approximately the distance from here to the door at the back of the church, underneath that pine tree, I see a patch of white. As I got closer, it appeared that an animal had been hit by a car, and it crawled up under the tree to die. And I got a little closer, and I was almost afraid to call out a name in fear of the response. Casey? It's gone. A little closer and yet, Casey, a head pops up. She started running at me, jumped in my arms. This dog had never done that before. Jumped in my arms, cried and cried. Casey, how in the world did you ever get here? I'm so sorry. Started to run myself, started to get the dog on a leash, and I got to the car, ready to take her home, just elated that she was alive and she appeared to be well. Thinking about all the people I needed to thank, the woman who called me twice, the state trooper, the people at the grocery store. Now I got to the car, and as Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. <laughs> I got Casey to the car, and I opened the back door. Come on, girl. She immediately crawled up in a ball, laying on the ground, crying. Come on, girl. Come on. She wouldn't move. Shaking, crying, would not come near the car. At that moment, I realized that someone had abused my dog and probably thrown it in a car and dumped it off the interstate. For God knows what reason. After some coaxing, some gentle words, some reassurance, I finally was able to get Casey to come up in the front seat with me and lay on my lap with her eye. She trusted me. She trusted me. Even after all that time that she was gone and I couldn't find her, she trusted me enough to let me take her home. And I thought that that is what my trip to heaven might be like. That when the Creator saw me, I would be joyful and jump in his arms and he would take me home. And yes, I may be scared, but he would calm me and he would soothe me. His spirit would be in me and it would work through me and I would be okay. And that was one of the occasions that I had that I can say the Holy Spirit was at work in so many different ways in that moment. I don't know how the Holy Spirit works particularly through you. I know that each and every one of you has had an occasion 
where you've got goosey, where you've had your heart filled with love, like at the birth of a child. I don't know how the Holy Spirit has touched you when you found yourself in service being what I consider for Clint, when you get all teary-eyed and your heart fills. That is the Holy Spirit attempting to work its way out of you and affirm to you that whatever it is you're experiencing at that moment is God sent and filled with His Spirit. I pray that each and every one of you has an occasion, if not yet today, an occasion at least one, where the Holy Spirit fills your heart, fills your, your, your mind and your body and your being, and you are able to express that spirit with those people who are around you. That's my prayer.